so that we can record your voice. So again, make sure that you speak into the microphone so that we can capture this very special moment. So without further ado, the Giants of Alexandria. Good morning, my name is Charles Hall. I am currently the pastor of St. John Baptist Church. It's an old church in Alexandria, about 92 years old. I'm not that old. Uh, I, I'm yes, also a, close. close to it. Okay. I'm also an a, a ex-business owner um, and a graduate from George Washington High School and an Alexandrian. And I've been fortunate enough to have grown up with these two giants uh, to my right. Uh, so I consider myself uh, very humble to be standing in the midst of these gentlemen and that they've kind of pulled me along on their coattail. Now, Bill, it's up to you.
But no, Bill Yule, uh, lifelong resident of Alexandria, and certainly pleased and honored to have been invited to be here this afternoon, participate in this uh, historic panel discussion, uh, particularly near the tail end of Black History Month here uh, in the United States. Um, but you know, I've, many of you who've met me before have heard me say that we shouldn't just honor black history or the history of any ethnicity, you know, for one particular day, month, or whatever. It should be something that's honored each and every day of the year. And I'm very impressed to see the diversity um, in this room because that's what makes T.C. Williams such an outstanding public high school is the fact that we do have people from all over the globe and you represent the, 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 the international uh, characteristics of the world, but not only the world, but you know the, the diversity that we respect and appreciate here in the city of Alexandria. Having said all that, native Alexandrian, born and raised here in the city, grew up um, in public housing for a few years after my birth, and then my family was able to move uh, to other parts of the city where I got to meet these young men uh, as, 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 as kids, and uh, then, uh, you know, public school at Laos Crouch Elementary, left Laos Crouch after the seventh grade. I was applied to, um, and I think all of us actually, were part of helping to integrate the public school system here in the city of Alexandria um, uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, I know I myself uh, had an opportunity to go to the all black high school, but I chose to help integrate uh, uh, the system by applying and, and, and you actually had to apply based on your academic performance in elementary school and everything to go to the eighth grade center school which was at uh, what's called Jefferson Middle School which is now where the Jefferson Elementary School is located and then from there I went to my freshman year to George Washington uh, and then the school system was expanding, leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, popular enrollment was growing and everything else. At that time, we had three existing high schools, Parker Gray, T.C. William, excuse me, Parker Gray, George Washington, Francis C. Hammond. Parker Gray being the all-black high school. And uh, so the school board decided that we need a fourth high school. And so they built a new school on this site. Uh, and that opened in 1965, and I was one of the students that were pulled from existing high schools to help open T.C. Williams, and, and the rest is history. And so from my high school years here at T.C. Williams, uh, when I graduated, 68, off to college, get a degree in accounting and business administration, come back to Alexandria, and then I decided after working for two years for a local business that I was not happy with the direction of the public school system. Remember, I said, we built the fourth high school because of the, the increased enrollment. Well, guess what? While I was away at college, the, the school system started going in the other direction. White flight, parents taking their kids out of school. They were afraid of integration and everything else. And so the, by the time uh, at age 24, I came to realize that our school system was almost falling apart. And so I decided, I raised my hand to city council and say, hey, I want to serve on the school board. So they pointed me to the school board I, at age 24, the youngest ever, and I served for 10 long years. And then I started a business uh, in 1987, a construction business doing well. And in 1994, folks approached me and said, hey, we want you on city council. I said, no, I'm enjoying making money and playing basketball after work. And so then I was convinced that I needed to step forward and run for elect elected office which I did, in 94 served uh, one election, served three terms, three years rather, then re-elected in uh, 97, became the vice mayor, and re-elected in 2000. And then 2003, it was an open seat for city count for mayor, and I ran against, a Rep I'm a Democrat, a Republican and Independent, and in 2003, the city of Alexandria was 254 years old. And so I made history by winning that election, becoming the first person of color to serve the city as its mayor. I was fortunate to be re-elected uncontested, meaning no opponents, in 2006, 2009, 2012, and then when I ran in 2015, there was some conspiracy at play. <laughs> folks, even though I was doing an outstanding job, some folks said, hey, you know, maybe it's time to get Bill out of office, and so we can talk about that later. Um, but i um, very uh, 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 proud of all of my accomplishments, not, not only mine, but of these gentlemen, plus many others who matriculated to our, through our public school system to become um, stellar, outstanding leaders, not only in the community here in Alexandria, but actually all across this country. Thank you.
Oh, by the way, he was uh, identified as a preacher, so he's the guy that can help you to re with your repentance. Um, I'm a politician, businessman, so I can help you with a lot of things. This guy, a lawyer, judge, guess what? He'll put he can, you away. He can put you away. <laughs> Good morning, or afternoon. My name is Nolan Dawkins. Uh, you want to say, you probably, many of you may not know me, and I hope that most of you do not know me, except for maybe in a, the sense that I am a, a person who lives in the community. I, actually, I live in the house I grew up in. That's right. You know, what's unique, and what Mayor, and I, I always refer to Mayor Yule as Mayor Yule, because he's going to always be my, my mayor, uh, is that the unique part of what you just heard from these two is that the three of us grew up less than 100 yards from one another. Mr. Charles Hall lived almost directly in front of me. Mayor Yule, right around the corner. And that's, that's probably something that probably doesn't have any significance to any of you. But we grew up at a time when uh, opportunities for many of us was not very great. It was not great in terms of what we could aspire to be. But I can assure you that as you hear these two talk, and perhaps me in some regards, none of us at any time thought that one day I'm going to be, <clears throat> I'm going to be the mayor of this city. Or one day I'm going, now what he didn't tell you, what, what Charles Hall didn't tell you, that he was in business and he was in control of over a hundred million dollars. He didn't tell you that. He told you he's a preacher. <laughs> but he didn't tell you about his business side. He was in charge of over a hundred million dollars. I, as I said to you, and as, as Judge, I mean, as uh, Mayor Yule just said, I grew up in the city as well as they, had very few opportunities very few opportunities for people that look like us. And we made opportunities be, and we took advantage of opportunities that came uh, along our way. I too was part of the Alexandria uh, Public School integration. I, my graduating class from George Washington High School had fewer than 10 African Americans. There were probably fewer than 10 students who spoke Spanish in the entire school. There were probably no students from Africa. And we had to uh, take advantage of what was made available to us. I left a, I left a, uh, a, a segregated public school system, Parker Gray, was, which was the only public high, public high school for African-Americans. Back then, we were Negroes. <laughs> OK. Uh, but the, the, the school had very few resources. I went to George Washington High School. As I said to you, there were fewer than 10 of us uh, who were of color. And I saw that the students who had opportunities at that school was much greater than we had at Parker Gray. I went to my, I went to my, my counselor at George Washington, remember there were fewer than 10, and told him that I wanted to go to college. And I asked him, could he send my transcript to a school? And I can almost remember to this day, he said to me, I didn't know you wanted to go to college because there was no expectation that we had any idea that we could do anything more than what we would ultimately do. Now, I went on to college, went to school in Ohio. Uh, I, oh, by the way, I played basketball. As most young men who, who in my day, I thought I was pretty good. I was terrible. <laughs> you know, the, 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 idea, the idea that, that all all people of color can play football or basketball and do it. No, I was. I, I, I was okay. I was okay. And I thought maybe that someday I would be able to go do more with my athletic skills. I couldn't. At, at some point, <laughs> you, you had one of those days too, huh? <laughs> okay. At, at some point, I, I decided that I, I'm going to go to school. 
my, my counselor at the time, and I'm going, not going to call his name, but I remember it to this day. He said to me he had no idea that I had any, any desire to do anything more than go out and get a job and work for someone like him. And I didn't do that. I went to school. I thought that maybe I could become a medical doctor. Now, remember, I wanted to be an athlete. Oh, another thing, my, my older brother was a very accomplished musician. I was a fairly accomplished musician. I thought that I could be a musician. That didn't work. I wasn't that. I didn't do that well because uh, I had a friend who who came along and could outplay me in less than two months. He was just here in the city about a, a week ago. Uh, Edward Hernandez. Edward picked up his phone, picked up my saxophone, my saxophone, <laughs> and he, he and he was able to outplay me in approximately two months. So I decided maybe music is not going to be my my. My, my ultimate goal in life. So I decided that I know what I'm going to do. I did fairly well in biology. I'm going to be a biology major and ultimately become a medical doctor. Well, here's the problem. If you're going to be a medical doctor, you have to take organic chemistry. <laughs> I didn't have a clue. So now I've got to decide to do something else. Now I've decided I'm going to become a history major. History. History is us. And went to ROTC, went into ROTC in college, served in the military, served in Vietnam. And I was one of the fortunate ones. I came home. I came home. And when I came home, I came home approximately December 12, 1971. You all weren't thought of then. <laughs> okay. 1971, I came home and decided that I needed to apply for a job. I applied for a job, and I got several offers, one of which was with, with a company called Owens, Illinois, in Toledo, Ohio. They were going to take me out to Toledo and give me a job in marketing, and I was going to, you know, forge my career doing marketing. They offered me the job. Now, this is, I want you all to think about this. They offered me the job, going to Toledo. I thought about it, and I said to myself, hmm, do I want to live in Toledo, Ohio for the rest of my life? And I said, no. I decided I'm going to go to law school. I called up the, the recruiter, told him, well, I'm not going to accept your job. I'm coming, I'm going to go to apply to law school. He said, well, have you been accepted? I said, no. He said, have you taken the LSAT? I said, no. He said, well, how are you going to law school? Well, I said, I don't know, but I'm going. <laughs> and, and, and fortunately for me, I was accepted at three law schools. But I want to tell you this. I wasn't the greatest student. I came along at the right time. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to in any way suggest to you that I, walk, I, I walked out of George Washington High School as an A student or the school that my central state Ohio and, uh, that I went to as an A student. I was not. But I came along at the right time. And that's what's really important for all of you. Take advantage of opportunities. And the opportunities that afforded me at that time was one that when I went to Seton Hall University in, New York, in Newark, New Jersey, I went to Seton Hall. Again, when I looked around my class, there were fewer than 10 African Americans in my class, again. So I kind of went full circle. But Seton Hall at the time was a, had started to accept more and more people of color, and I, I happened to be the right time, the right color, and probably enough money to go to school. So that's where I am. And then at some point, I'm going, to, I'm going to shorten this. You know, they told me that the mayor would be long-winded, and obviously I'm taking up some of his time. It's my high but, school. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but then, through with that, I, I practiced law here in the, in, in the city. I practiced law in New Jersey for several years. Came to New Jersey. Came to, came to Alexandria. Worked as a city assistant city attorney. Got some fairly decent opportunities at that time. Worked for the Attorney General doing the condemnation work. I worked for the city doing their law, their ad valorem lack tax litigation. And then I decided at some point, my friend, Judge Gerald Lee, and I, I always give him credit, 
my friend Judge Jolie, who just retired from the federal bench, we were both young practicing lawyers, said to me, you know, there's an opportunity for you to sit as a substitute judge here in the city. I had no idea what a substitute judge was. I, I, I was a lawyer, but I had no idea the, the idea of how you become a substitute judge. I became a substitute judge. I then became, at some point, decided to run for, uh, to run, to become a full-time judge in the juvenile court. And for the next 12 years, next 14 years, I was a judge in the juvenile court here in Alexandria, and, and for the last 10 years, I've been on the circuit court here in Alexandria. But? But? The first. Well, again, we are all the first. And that's what makes, we talk about, when we talk about history, we are all the first. We are all the first who had no idea that we could be <laughs> what we ultimately wound up being, but we took advantage of those opportunities. So I, was, I, I will leave you with this. I'm now on the circuit court here in the city of Alexandria. And as a judge in the juvenile court, I had so much to do with your lives as juveniles. And if I had come to this room 10 years ago, unfortunately, when I looked out among you, I would, have, I would see several people that I'd had in front of me several people who ultimately may have made, made some right decisions and kind of turned their lives around. But also, there were probably several people in that room who didn't do so. My role now as a circuit court judge, I deal with people and money. I'm now working on a, a, a multi-million dollar medical malpractice case. That case will some, someday, at some point, the, the plaintiff may wind up with a lot of money or with a very few dollars in his or her pocket. So my role now is very different. I don't deal with people, young people, but I deal with people. And I hope that someday I'll look out among you and see one of you on the other side of the bench acting, serving as a lawyer in my court. Amen. All right. Thank you. Well, they feel, they feel guilty now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, they said preachers talk, but uh, just about 30 seconds, uh, my background is the same as theirs. I'm a, uh, when I, when I run, came out the side of my house, I'd run into Bill's house. <laughs> but just for a show, like, and, I, and, I, and I, you know what, we need, we, yeah. we need to add to it. We were all poor. Yeah. Yeah. But we didn't know that, it. That, that, we, didn't, we didn't know it, but we, we, didn't we, were, we were poor. You know. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a uh, Lyles Crouch, uh, Parker Gray, and George Washington. Uh, fortunate enough to. Uh, you know, unlike unlike uh, Judge Dawkins when he said he was not a good athlete, I'm going to go on the other side and say I was a very good athlete. <laughs> he he uh, thought he was. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, was all-state football, all-state track, all-state wrestling. Uh, I, did it, I did it all, but I was never qualified to go to college. So when when I graduated, uh, people who uh, couldn't run as fast as I could, couldn't do all those things, were getting scholarships. And so I went in and said I want to go to college, and, and I got the same thing that Judge Dawkins got. They said to me is, I didn't know you wanted to go to college. That's right. And I was fortunate enough that the athletic director, Clay Estes, who I didn't even know knew my name, said to me that you need to go to college. And, and I had not taken college boards, and he said, I went to a school in Tennessee. If you're willing to go a, a week early, we'll make arrangements to get you college boards. So I went to school in Tennessee, Bethel University, and I ended up being one of five African-American students uh, in 1967 in a school in, in a place that I never thought I'd end up. Uh, so I graduated from uh, Bethel University with a BS. I did my graduate work at Southeastern University, went back to school to get a degree in Bible study. So I spent a great deal of my, my life in school. I was fortunate enough to run a business, became the youngest general manager, in, before I owned my own business, became the youngest general manager in Boeing, the Boeing Corporation's history. I uh, became a general manager of the Boeing Corporation and computer division at a young age. Uh, as Nolan said, my responsibility was several hundred million dollars at the time and a lot of people. Uh, and then I started my own business, uh, which I ran. We were fortunate enough <laughs> not to be in the hundred million dollar category, but we were a multi-million dollar company. I uh, ran that business until 2013 when I received a, a 2011 uh, I received a different call in my life. I'd been a minister for a long time, but I received a call to become a, a pastor, to walk away from my business 
and to go past a church in a community which I grew up, which is something totally, I, was not part of my plan. And so I was fortunate enough to have two sons, and I left them to the business, and I started doing God's work. And here I am. Um, I know you want to take question, uh, ask us questions, but let me preface um, something again about each and every one of us, the three of us up here, is the fact that there was a, there, there's a common denominator in terms of why and where we are today. Who, who, who knows what that denominator is? What's the common denominator for our success? Why are you in school? Education. Huh? Education, to get an education. That's exactly the message that, you know, when I was thinking about what I was gonna say, and I said my, this everywhere I go, even to adults, the fact remains is that we would not be where we are if it weren't for the fact that we got an education. When I say got an education, it was tough, it was hard, we were poor, but we persevered. And not only did we graduate from high school, and the challenge graduating from high school was like, we all wanted to go to college, and it was like, none of us had money, the fam our parents didn't have money. And even me here at T.C. Williams, uh, while I was bright, smart, probably in the top, to finish a, a class of 380, I think I was number 34 academically, and but yet I wanted to go to college, I was great at math, I wanted to go and major in math, be a mathematician or an accountant, and so I was talking to my guidance counselor and she said, um, well, then apply to certain schools. Well, guess what? I didn't even have, or my mother, the $5, $10, $15 application fee to apply. But the guidance counselor says, Bill, don't worry about that. I'll pay for your application fees, just apply. I did, and the rest is history was able to go to college, get a degree, and you know, I get choked up every time I think about it. I remember even after my freshman year, I wrote my guidance counselor and said, hey, thank you for what you've done for me. I'm making money on campus, I wanna repay you. She said, no, she says, I don't need the money. She said, but what I want you to do is when you finish high school, you help some other young people. And that has been my life story, helping young people from that day forward. But again, education got us to where we are. Let me, I want to just add one thing. Uh, unlike Bill, because I want to let you know, you, you might not be at the upper echelon of education. When I graduated from GW, I probably had a C minus to B, D plus average. Uh, I was probably borderline for C, college. C minus to B plus. No, to a D plus. Oh, oh D, plus. <laughs> D plus. Okay. <laughs> I was between, between the C and the D. Okay. Thank, all right. thank you, George. All right. You okay. <laughs> now you know why I was in that category. That, that was a real range. Now, 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 now you know why I'm in that category. I was probably borderline <laughs> getting in college. It wasn't because I, I was not <laughs> capable. Uh, uh, it, it was because I, I wanted to be the best athlete I could be, and I wanted to try to do what was required to pass. But when I was fortunate enough to get in college, I found out that they challenged me. And, uh, and I was an average student in high school, and I was an honor roll student in college. And, and, and so what, what made the difference between being an average student in high school and an honor student in college is was because uh, I was put in an environment where um, I, I saw people study and, and, and get good grades, and, and, and I, I felt like I wanted to be as good as they were. And I decided to try this thing called study, library and everything else. And I found out that I, it turned out to be that I could compete, that, that I was as smart as anybody else if I was willing to put in the time. And when I put in the time, I was fortunate enough to be led to something that, that I could do. I was led to accounting, and accounting came very easy to me. Business courses came very easy to me. And so I was led to those courses. And you know, when, when, you, when you put in the time, you get the results. And uh, uh, you know, I, I wish I'd have found out early in high school, but thank God I found it out before it was too late. Mm -hmm. And that has served me well. Let me also set the stage for you. When we grew up, uh, and I remember 20 years ago, coming here and talking to different classes um, at different points in times, in elementary schools as well. But 
the reality is that we grew up during very hard, challenging times. I mean, when I look around today and then you talk to, I talk to students, middle school, high school, everybody seems to be, you know, like depressed and they're worried about this and worried about that. And I say, well, you don't have to worry about anything. All you got to do is worry about getting your education because us responsible adults, the leaders, we're the ones that are taking care of all the things you can't control. You can't control what's going on in the White House on Capitol Hill. You can't control what rhetoric comes out of North Korea or anything mm -hmm. like that. What you can control is getting your education and then getting out after your high school or college and getting a job, being engaged in, in society, helping to make a difference like we've done. But when we came up, we came up through the civil rights era. We came up when race relations and everything else was poor, um, rioting and everything else. We came up during the Vietnam War. We came up, I, re, I can remember very vividly when Martin Luther King was assassinated and what I had to do that next morning to get to school before every other student got to school here at TC and I huddled with the principal and said, Mr. Secord, we can't have everybody come to school today and just go to the classrooms for home, their home rooms. It won't work. I said, we got to direct everybody into the auditorium so that we can have a dialogue and we can pray and console each other and folks can talk about what this, you know, his tragic death meant and everything else. And we did similarly when Robert uh, Kennedy, uh, Attorney General, was assassinated. So, and that was in 68. So we've gone through a lot and this whole country could have fallen apart. But guess what? It didn't. And the reason why it didn't is because there's common sense people that want to make things better, but like us, but again, <laughs> you, you, you gotta be engaged, you gotta be involved, and you gotta stand tall. But for you guys, don't, you can worry, but, and I worried when I was in high school about Vietnam, I was fortunate that I found a way to get out of it, and we can talk about that later. Uh, but uh, and going to college, I went for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> going to college certainly was one way to help. But uh, the reality is, is that you know you can't control even even in our leadership roles today, we can't control everything else that, that's going on. But we can be part of helping to educate and and be role models and mentors for folks that we that we come in contact with and that's what's important Do I have you, you, you know you look you, you you sit here today and <clears throat> you say to yourselves what do these three old guys have to say to me that I don't already know I know it all and then I I, I say to you if you have the opportunity as you become our age, if you have the opportunity at some point as you grow old and you think about what I'm about to say to you, to look back in your life and say, if I could change one decision, just one decision in my life, how would my life be different? And I tell you, and I, I asked that question as I, when I was on the juvenile bench, I always put that question to, to young people as they appeared before me. Because if you think about where you are now, there's so much ahead of you. But at some point, it's going to be so much behind you. And there's not much left ahead of you. And you think back, what if that day that I did X or I did Y, if I had not done something, if I had done something different, how would my life be different? Now, I'm going to tell you this story. And he's not here today. And I, I always repeat this story. I mentioned my, my friend, Judge Lee, who was just retired from the federal bench. Judge Lee tells a story about, and he wouldn't mind me telling the story because I repeated it before. He tells a story about one night growing up in southeast Washington. Three of, three of his friends knocked on his door and said, we're going to Virginia. We're going to do a stick up. Judge Lee said, not me. They were apprehended incarcerated, and probably had to do some time in prison. That one decision that he made that night turned his life around, because if he had said yes, then he would never become the person that he became. And I'm telling you his story because he's not here, but that's a story that you need to hear. That one decision that you're going to make over the, next, over the course of your lives may impact the rest of your lives. 
So when you think about what you're going to do and, and opportunities that you have, take advantage of those opportunities, avoid those opportunities to do wrong. Avoid those opportunities because they may impact you for the rest of your lives. I sound like a preacher, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> no, and just to give you a little bit of focus about Judge Lee, he was on the federal bench, I mean the federal court here in Alexandria, uh, over in Carlisle, uh, the federal courthouse that's there. He actually was engaged and involved af after the 9-11 uh, incident with having to deal with all of those bad people that were part of 9-11. He had to rule and judge on their incarceration, their penalties, and everything else, and has done others since then. So that's the, the level of how famous or infamous or whatever Judge Lee is and was. Do they have questions about us? Yeah. Any questions about us? Yes. Well, um, at this point, now that you've heard, uh, now that you've heard uh, sort of the opening dialogue, um, the, the real point of this is not for them to present to you. We brought in these giants so that you have an opportunity to have this dialogue with them because often uh, you don't get a chance to ask wisdom questions. Uh, very often wisdom comes to you uh, from hard knocks and the mistakes that you've made in your own life. But certainly uh, anyone can learn from their own mistakes. But it takes wise people to learn from the mistakes of others. So you have three giants who have overcome serious obstacles to really transcend where they're from and what happened to them. And, and the, the situation of this great nation being uh, racist. Uh, because racism is, in essence, when a nation's institutions and laws uh, discriminate and repress specific groups of people based on race. So we're not just talking about individual acts of feelings. What we're talking about, they faced systems that were uh, attempting to oppress, and yet they were able to overcome. So having said that, this is now your seminar to be able to ask the wisdom questions and to get the answer. So, um, if you uh, have a question, just go ahead and proceed to the mic. Um, so just proceed right to this microphone right here and ask your question. She's ready. Hi guys, yeah, um, my name is. Oh. Ready. Uh, please state your name for the record. My name is Kennedy Rowe. I'm a senior here at TC Williams. Um, focusing in on you guys helping desegregate the schools in Alexandria, Virginia. I was curious on how that helped shape your life and then where you're going and then um, the experiences you experience while desegregating the schools. Great question, gentlemen. They always want me to go first so right. I can get short. Reverend. Uh, I, 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 we had it on multiple levels. Uh, uh, these gentlemen uh, start, started at the high school level before myself. I was a junior before I went to uh, George Washington, it was a devastating experience for me because I'd been in a, uh, a dominant uh, African-American and Negro setting before that. Uh, so, so getting uh, used to the environment uh, was traumatic, but, but it was, and when I look back on it, it was necessary, it was essential, and it was a springboard uh, because it, it, it started to uh, force us to uh, survive in an environment that would be more reflective of life. And when I went to college, I went to a college deep in the South. The first day I arrived, that weekend we tried to go to a movie and, and found out that uh, the movie was segregated, that African Americans had to set up stairs and sit downstairs. And, and uh, it, it went to a college that found out that uh, we only had five African Americans in the, in the whole college. Uh, but but it taught me, uh, it turned into a competitive, it taught me that if I can survive in this environment, I can survive anywhere. And, uh, and, and it, it also uh, taught me that people are people regardless of the color. Uh, some of my uh, lifelong friendships come out of that environment and, and uh, it, it causes uh, each one of us to look at the person based upon the, as Martin Luther King said, the content of the character, not the color of the skin. Uh, uh, and, and so it, it, I believe it prepared me for the business environment. Uh, when, when I graduated, I went to Texaco. I was the first, first uh, 
black, African-American, a Negro sales representative in Texaco uh, when, I, uh, when I went to uh, uh, Boeing. I went to General Electric first. I was the first in the computer training program. And then Boeing hired me away as uh, the first African-American in the Northern Virginia office. And I later became the, uh, the youngest African-American general manager. So uh, being pushed in that environment uh, prepared me not to be frightened of an environment that didn't necessarily look like me. So when I got in that environment, I was not intimidated because I had learned through the matriculation of school that I could compete with anybody on any level if I was willing to play the game. If I was willing to, uh, to come out of the streets, so I was willing to get off the basketball court and go to the library and crack open my books, I could compete with anybody. And that was a revelation to me. And, and that, that took me into the business world. I, I found that business world that if I was willing uh, to understand what the assignment was and to pay the price to learn that I could not only compete, but I could excel in the business environment. And so, so, so what I learned by going to GW and then going to Bethel University and other schools was that I could compete. And it made no difference if I walked into a classroom, it never fazed me if I was the only one that had a dark complexion. It never fazed me at all. Because I realized that regardless of what I look like, I can compete with anybody in here. And I'll, I'll tell you, when I graduated from Bethel, uh, there were only two blacks in my graduation class. And that was my brother and I. <laughs> my brother graduated from high school two years ahead of me. And I talked him into coming down to Bethel. And we graduated together. And I remember my parents driving down. So, so I graduated in a school, a university, with two blacks. <laughs> and those two blacks were brothers. <laughs> so, so you want to talk about learning how to compete. So I really don't care what the playground looks like. You can compete. You can compete. Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't compete. All you got to do is use the God-given gift that God gave you is your intellect. And the earlier you start to use that, the easier the process will be. If you start using it in high school, it's going to be a lot easier in college. And it will, it will serve you well in the business world. Unlike Bill, I didn't use mine as well in elementary school as he did. But I walk, I walk with him now. Yeah. And I think of it. On yeah. Let me just add, um, when I was in elementary school, first of all, we all, Alexander way back then, um, pretty much neighborhoods were segregated. Um, blacks lived over here in a cluster, whites lived here, and that was not just Old Town, but throughout the whole entire city. But uh, as a seventh grader uh, in, in elementary school at Laos Crouch, I was a school photographer, and I would walk past two elementary schools to get to <laughs> Laos Crouch that were all white schools. Right. Right. Um, before, again, we started integrating them, and one day we got a, the principal got a phone call from the principal at um, Lee Elementary School, which is now where the city's Park and Recreation Headquarters is located, um, and, and North Old, and South Old Town, and said, hey, we're having a science fair, but our Polaroid camera is not working. Do you have one? And so the principal said, yes, of course. She said, I'll have one of our outstanding students bring it over to the school. And so I got called out of class by the principal. She said, Bill, um, Lee Elementary is having a science fair. They need to borrow our camera, can you deliver it? And I said, sure, so it was like what, five blocks away, six blocks away, and then I get over to the school, I knock on the door, open. That was the first time, it, a shocker to me, that I came to realize that we were in a segregated environment, only because at Laos Crouch we were all black, but you know, didn't really matter. Over there, Lee was all white, didn't really matter. And the reason why it didn't matter because every day after school and on weekends, we all played on the same playgrounds and all the sports and everything else and we knew each other, but it was only during school days, five days a week, where we were segregated. And so when I walked into that building, I got like slapping, I said, oh my God, this is different. So I went to the principal's office and then she said, thanks for bringing, I said, I'll, I'll take pictures. I'll, I'm here, let me take pictures. And I did, and I, we went to different classrooms and I saw kids that I played with almost every day. 
and so that led me when the system, the school system started, you know, integrating and then, you know, when TC opened and pulling students from Hammond and GW and Parker Gray to create the new TC Williams, which was in 1965. Uh, I entered here as a sophomore because we were freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. We didn't have a senior class. And uh, so I decided, hey, you know what? I was a student leader in elementary school. Let me be a student leader here at high school, which I did and was. And then uh, graduated and decided that, hey, you know what? I'm going to take that learning experience uh, from TC uh, to college. And when I went off to college, I, I didn't have a choice, I can tell you. I was poor. So when a school said, uh, and I applied to half dozen, only one school offered me a four-year academic scholarship, and one school, which I didn't even play football, Brown University, came and interviewed me, and I remember this till I die, and uh, I wrestled, and they said, hey, we want to give you an, a football scholarship. And I said, I don't even play football. But that's how desperate they were to get African Americans to come to their schools. And then I said, oh, I don't want to be up in that cold weather in New England and everything else. Well, I got an academic scholarship from a small college co-ed, a private school called Quinnipiac, Q-U-I-N-N-I-P-I-A-C, college, which today is Quinnipiac University, and they're famous for their Quinnipiac Polling Institute. I was one of 30 minorities in a student population of 1,100 when I arrived there on campus. And then I decided, you know, this isn't going to phase me. I'm, a, I'm, I'm strong. I'm, 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 like he said, you know, we, we've gone through a lot. So when they announced um, for class officers opportunity to run for freshmen, I put up my candidates information and everything else. There were six other candidates running. Nobody knew me other than the folks that I had met, but because I had something unique about me, I won to be freshman class president. Then I was president of the sophomore class. As a junior, I was president of the student government uh, and everything, and I was big man on campus and president in the president's office, the dean's office, and everybody wanting my input and advice. And we had a student strike. Uh, then uh, folks said, hey, you know, tuition's going up and w we need to prevent all this. And uh, this was all during the Vietnam, uh, winding down in the Vietnam War. And, and my school in Connecticut, uh, town of Hamden, is just 15 minutes north of New Haven, where Yale University is located. And so when the student strike started, we had the Black Panthers from New, Jer from New Haven, Connecticut. We had the Yaleys come in. We had the v vet Vietnam veterans. Everybody wanted to be part of this demonstration. And but I held it all together. We were successful. We won what we wanted to achieve. Graduated from college, back to Alexandria, and then that set me to the path to get, be where I am today, to always be a leader to help make a difference. And that's, you know, so the, again, integration, uh, this breaking down those barriers, you know, led, particularly for me, led me to be where I am today. I will also say, because I had an opportunity to participate in the making of the movie, Remember the Titans? You guys ever see that movie? All right, well, um, Coach Boone and I were very great close friends, and I was vice mayor at the time, and Herman came into my business office one day, and he said, Bill, I have an idea. And I said, what? He says, I want to make a movie about, you know, the championship team of 71. And I laughed at him. I said, who would want to watch a movie about some guys? You know, he said, believe me. He said, I think I can get Disney involved in this. Well, long story short, he had made contact with the Disney folks, and then he was coming to my office often to t give me a status update and so forth. And then one day he came in the office and he said, hey, you know, I need to get you on the phone with um, um, Jerry Bruckmeyer, the producer. And I said, why, Coach, what's wrong? He says, let me dial him up. And so he started talking to him on the phone, and they were arguing over where the movie was going to get filmed. Of course, we all wanted it filmed here in Alexandria. Disney had a different idea. and so. Coach Boone got mad and he said, you can take this phone and I grabbed it from his hands and I said, he didn't mean that. And so we salvaged the movie and the rest is history. But I say all that simply because if you've watched a movie, and again, it wasn't filmed in Alexandria, it was filmed in a small town outside of Georgia because they said, oh, the airplane noise from National Airport would interfere. Well, they make movies in Washington every day. So, um, but they had their reason for it. And then, you know, got to go out to the uh, rollout of the movie at, um, uh, in, in California at the Rose Bowl, 100,000 people in the stadium watching the movie and crying, 
their eyes out, and at the, end of the, the next morning we were all at breakfast, and I was trying to get some compensation for the former players, the real players on the team. They all, Disney had flown all of the players, the cheerleaders and their families and everybody out to watch to, you know, this the new movie. And so I'm sitting at the table negotiating with the Disney folks, and uh, I said, uh, these guys deserve like at least $10,000 each, and they said, oh, we don't have any kind of money. And they said, it's, it's a tight, but we, 25 million to produce the movie. We got five million to market it, promote it. And I said, so that's 30 million. I said, I guarantee you that movie will make two or three times that amount of money. Well, again, this was when the movie first came out. What, 2001, 2002, somewhere around there? And so, no, it's actually 2000. And so then I said to him, um, uh, you know, let's, so on a napkin I calculated, and so any, any, uh, the guys end up getting $5,000 a piece. Uh, Disney said, we'll give them lifetime passes for them and their families. Well, how many times can you go to Disney in your lifetime? So we got compensation for them, but guess what? That movie today, and I've traveled the world, when I'm in Istanbul, Turkey, I'm in Paris, France, I'm in Saudi Arabia, well, Saudi Arabia, because they don't have movies th theaters yet, um, but Germany, anywhere else, I've traveled, Taiwan, and that movie is playing still around the globe. Not only that, when people see me with the T.C. Williams jacket, they say, remember the Titans. They say, Alexander, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So it's put Alexander and T.C. on the international map, but year to date, and this is probably numbers that are six months old because I remember looking it up. Coach Boone had uh, no idea how much money the movie had grossed. The movie has made over $1 billion for Disney by just still in the theaters and then sh every time it replays on television. So that, that makes TC part of another history. I'm going to be a little different than these. You ask a question, I'll give you a very simple answer. Okay, because I don't think, you know, they talk about a lot of things, but I'm going to tell you just one thing. You have opportunities now that we couldn't envision. Opportunities now that weren't available to us. Opportunities now that if you don't take advantage of it, shame on you. So after hearing all of that, the success that you've heard this morning, understand that the success that you have, you're in control of that. And if you don't take advantage of what you have, are in control of, shame on you because you are losing what has been given to you that we didn't have. So your answer to your question is, how did our experience make a difference in our lives? We took advantage of opportunities, period. Don't be bashful. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Abdul. Um, I was just wondering, like, was there any any, any like moment of your life where you were like, um, you didn't you didn't think you were gonna get to where you wanted to get to, and like you you thought it wasn't it wasn't gonna happen? Did you ever like what was like your biggest motivation, I guess, for like you know going on to the next thing and getting to where you wanted to get to? I, I, I'll, I'll start this time. Yeah, there were, and, and I'm again. I'm not going to be like these guys. They're long-winded. Anyway. Uh, well, you're a judge. I, <laughs> <laughs> I think every point in my life there was a hurdle that suggested that I couldn't overcome. And again, having made the opportunity, having taken advantage of the opportunity, I, I'll give you an example. I, I'm a member of the New Jersey Bar. Took, had to take this bar exam. I decided to come to Virginia. I applied for a job in Virginia, and the employer said, well, you can't get that job because you're not a member of the Virginia bar. Sorry, I'm having a I connection. Please try again in a moment. See, in the 21st century, we also have phones to turn it <laughs> Opportunities. But I, 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 I came to Virginia took the Virginia bar exam. And the difference is, let me tell you something about, about a hurdle. The hurdle is, I didn't study for the Virginia, you're talking about education, I didn't study for the Virginia bar exam. 
I came to Virginia Cole, and I, when I sat down next to a young man, he was from one of the local law schools, and he said to me, uh, where are you from? I said, I'm from Virginia. I'm from New Jersey. He said, well, what bar exam did you take? What bar re review course did you take? I said, I took none. He said, well, how do you know Virginia procedure? I said, I know none. I'm, a, I'm reverting back to when, the, when, I, when I turned down the job at Orleans, Illinois, I'm doing some stupid things. I'm gonna take the Virginia bar, and I, don't know, I haven't taken a bar review course. He says, well, how are you going to pass that exam? I said, beats me. <laughs> so, sit down, took the exam. About eight weeks later, my mother called me and says, you have a letter from the Virginia Bar uh, Office. I said, well, tell me, is it a fat letter hmm. or is it a thin letter? She said, it's a fat letter. She said, well, I said, well, you don't need to open it. I passed. So, so I didn't think I could do it, but I did it. So, so to make a long story short, don't ever shortchange yourself. If that's, if, that's, if that's the end to that story, never shortchange yourself, but make sure that you take advantage of any opportunity that you have. All right. uh, let me just add, and, and, and we've all had obstacles, and I'm not going to really talk about the obstacles. I'm going to talk about um, uh, what inspired me to you know, want to go to college and everything else, and primarily and achieve that goal and, 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 and come back and do something. Uh, primarily, it was because uh, I wanted to get my family out of public housing. I wanted them to have a better life than my mother, my sister, and brother. And so I figured getting a college education was going to help open those doors of opportunities. It did. When I finished college, came back home, it took me two years before I was able to buy my first house. But guess what? I didn't even have enough money to put the down payment uh, on the house. But it's, it's, and I'll talk about networking in a few moments, but my boss, who I, the, I worked for, and uh, uh, you know, after two years, I said, hey, I wanna buy this house, can I take out a loan? And he said, sure, Bill, and he provided me with the loan. I said, I'm sure I'll have an opportunity to pay you back. So that helped me buy our first house, get us out of public housing, and the rest is history, and I bought other houses since then, and everything else, but, um, and then I stayed with my company, uh, my employer for 16 years. I never had another employer in my entire work career other than my very first job because when I left him, I started my own construction business, which I learned from him, and with my accounting degree and everything, that helped me to sail for the next 30 years, you know, running my own business, and then obviously going into politics. So. Do we have any obstacles? She said, ever feel like, what was the question? Ever feel like giving up or having obstacles? Uh, oh. Seemed like every day. Open uh, when I, I left Alexandria to go to an environment I didn't know in Tennessee, uh, for the first year, I felt like giving up, but I didn't give up because I was the first one in my family to go away to college. And what kept me there was not wanting to disappoint my mother and my father. And I had teachers that, uh, I had some teachers that had poured in me, uh, Mr. Carlton Fun, uh, Ms. Eloy Henderson, Mr. Alfred Carter, they poured in me and, I, and I'd stay in contact with them and I, I felt like giving up, but I didn't want to disappoint them. And that kind of helped me get through that freshman year. And after the freshman year, I didn't want to disappoint myself. Uh, you know, I, I, I felt that I, you know, I didn't just need to lean on them. I, I, I kind of learned I want to do it for me now because I can compete. I don't want to let myself down. So, so that was the stimulus that kept me there. But I can tell you my freshman year was very difficult. Had I not had that base back home, uh, people who wanted to see me succeed, uh, it, it, it was very tough, very tough. Because I was, I, was, I was learning how to deal in that environment. Uh, the race system was, you know, it, uh, this environment was mild to where I went to school, so it was it was a, it was a it was a tough environment. Uh, I was in Memphis when Dr. Martin Luther King got killed. So it was a tough environment then. Uh, but but uh, uh, if you have the support system, till you can get strong enough yourself and want to do it for yourself. When you want to do it for yourself, then you wake up every morning with a, a refound determination. Hello, my name is Maria Constanza Megre. Hey, um, Maria, sorry to cut in, but you need to speak loud and repeat the question. 
question someone so that everybody in the back can hear? Okay. Thank you. My name is Maria Constanza Megre, and I was wondering when, when you grow in an environment with such injustice as you did, and you feel like you have to change it, regardless of how much of a leader you are, there are always moments where you feel like you can't make it, like you're not enough yourself as an individual. How do you overcome that feeling every day in your life until now if you still feel it? Thank you. That's a very good question, and that will let me get to, I said I'll come back and talk about networking. You know what networking is about? Networking is, and, and, and you know, years ago when I first, we all started, everybody had business cards. And if you didn't have a business card, then you were left out of being able to communicate with someone. Because again, we didn't have the technology we have today with the iPhones, and you can get numbers real quick, and text and email. So you exchange business cards. There was one time in my desk, I had, like maybe 3,000 cards stacked up, because I, that, that was the number of people I met in my first 15, 16 years out of college. But when I say networking, uh, it's really, and I'm sure all of us, each of us can attest to the fact that in addition to family helping us, but the mere fact of people that we met along the way. Uh, you, you, you met at a restaurant, you met maybe at a bar, you, know, you shake hands with people at a meeting or event at church. These are all the folks that you come back and call on. And, but, you know, and they'll, they'll be there for you, they'll help support you and everything else. But if you don't network, you can't be successful at anything. And as I look around this room, I'm sure that two or three of you can say, oh yeah, I know Mark over here and Cindy over there, but to, the reality of it all is, you guys should know each and every one of you um, because you, you're, you're here at this wonderful school and through just uh, getting to know each other, be, be with each other, talk to each other, you should be one big, huge family. I'm planning our 50th reunion, class reunion, coming up in November of this year for homecoming. And when, my, when I called a, a group of my former students at college, I mean high school student classmates together, you know, I thought it would be tough to get two or three to show up. The very first meeting we had 10. We had a meeting last Sunday. We had like 25. And now on Facebook, we're getting, I mean, the reaction to everybody wanting to come back together for our fifth year class reunion is astounding. We know that we're a class of 380. We know that 100 have died off or we just can't contact them. And we said, oh, well, let's plan on maybe 75 to 100 folks coming to town. Right now, we're going to probably have almost 200 people coming back for our 50th high school reunion. You know why? And we all talked about this last Sunday. Because when, when we came to TC, you know, 1,000 students at the time, we all got to know all 1,000 of us. That's the difference. And that's networking. And, that's, and if you're going to be successful in anything in life, learn to network. And your, your reality is a little different than ours. Your reality is, is that as you look to your left or look to your right, there, there's probably someone who didn't have the same life experience or where they came from as you. But ultimately, at some day, that same person may be Charles Hall, may be Mayor Yule. Keep in touch with these people. Understand, your, your reality is in, incredible in that when I went to high school, there was one person other than the, the 10 African Americans in high school from another country. She, she had a young lady by the name of Chandra Madan, and she was from India. Now that's, a, that's an interesting story too in and of itself. Although during the time of segregation, <clears throat> I, I have no idea where people of the nationalities of the the, the ethnic, ethnicity that you have come from, where they would have gone to school because there was only a black school or a white school. And I guess at some point, they, as, the, as the immigration started, we started to see more kids in school. But I say to you, and I, I'm probably rambling just a little bit, but I, I say that it's important that you know who you associate with and ultimately keep in touch because you, there may be a time when you are going to be able to reach back and t say to that person, oh, by the way, I see that you are now in charge of $100 million, $200 million now. Is there something you can do for me or is there something I can do for you? So just remember, don't ever lose sight of where you came from or where you're going. The young lady's name, was it Maria? Yeah. Maria? Yeah, I want to make sure. I, 
I think I heard two parts to your question. Uh, I am correct me if I'm wrong. I think that first part was uh, uh, how do we feel trying to change the environment we were in and whether or not we want to give up. And the second part was uh, how do we feel today? Am I simply, is that, is that the question? You know, and Bob, how help. do you overcome the feeling that you can't change what's wrong? Yeah, it, it is a, what, 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 an, what an outstanding question. Uh, for me, overcoming that problem, because so many of, so many of us have a pull in our life to try to change uh, the environment which we're part of, whether that's high school, whatever it is. Uh, what we find out is the best way to change it is first of all, you have to be a part of the system to change anything. You can't change from the outside. And so to be a part of something means we have to learn how to uh, exist within the guidelines of the environment. So if you're gonna change high school for the better, you have to learn how to exist within the confinements of high school. That means you have to learn how to exist within the rules and learn how to uh, structurally, legally change but you can't do that change unless you're on the inside. So there's some people who think that high school should be changed, but they want to change from the outside. You can't change from the outside. You have to become part of the system. And to become part of the system, you have to come in and be accepted. And to be accepted, you have to, you have to learn to abide by the rules of the system. And, and it's the same way today as you get into the business world, same way for me now, is there are a lot of things that I, that I want to change personally. But, but I find out that, that I'm just giving lip service if I'm outside. If I want to change, I have to be willing to sacrifice and even to do or put myself in some positions that I don't want to be in in order to be part of the system. Because there's some things that I might not feel good about, but, but, but I have to be part of the system. And when I want to change, when I become, when I want to get into the system, the best way I can make change is, is the, is the, is the change myself first, let other people see the change in me. If I'm part of the system, I want to reflect the change that I'm talking about. If, if, if I want to be part of a system where people are running rampant, they're stealing whatever it is, where when I get part of the system, I want to do what Judge Lee did. I want to be able to stand in the midst of that system and say, not me. And then let them see my life move up based upon the decision that I made. But the two things, you have to be part of the system, you can't be on the outside, and you got to be willing, when you get part of the system, you got to be willing to stand and let the masses go on. And when the masses fall, they'll be looking to the one that stood. But if you don't stand and you go with the masses, when the masses fall, they have nobody to look on, then they continue to tumble. So, so when you're inside the system, do not be afraid once you get inside the system and learn how to play the rules, don't be afraid to be different. Don't be afraid to be different. I, I hope I answered your question. And let me give you an example of that. Um, and I'm sure, I don't know how these gentlemen, where their support was, but when a Barack, a, a Barack Obama first announced his candidacy, and I had met him in 1994 um, when I went to a, not excuse me, 97, uh, heard him speak at, uh, at the Democratic National Convention in Boston, and we're sitting out in the convention hall, and this young man who I knew was a, a state legislature and a, a new U.S. senator got up to speak, and I said, oh my God, this guy someday is gonna be the first African-American vice president of this country. Well, guess what? Hmm. He didn't want to be vice president. He wanted to be president. Hmm. And I, like a lot of other folks, got out there, campaigned for him nationally and everything else. I actually brought him here to T.C. Williams High School on a very freezing minus 10 degree Sunday morning um, to have him speak you know, here in Alexandria and so forth. Well, he won. And that inspired, and his message was about change. And, and that's why people supported him. He won, and you know, I've gotten to go to the White House a thousand times while I was in office, and people asked me the other day, said, have you been to the White House yet? I said, no, because I'm sure I'm not gonna get invited, because I didn't support the current president. And I just simply say that to say that the reason, and people say, well, how did Trump win? Trump won because he had a message that he aroused some other folks who were sitting on their hands, and finally they decided, we're gonna get up, and this is a candidate, we going to support, and the people that supported Barack Obama just said, hey, you know what, um, you know, I'll pass on this as well. You get what you pay for. 
That's the bottom line. You get what you pay for. But you got to, like Charles said, you have to be involved. You got to be engaged to help make that difference. Just, just want to offer a couple of things uh, real quick. Um, you guys, I know most of you guys know me as Cameron and Jaquan's dad, right? Um, Some of you may know that I'm on the school board here in Alexandria. Uh, a story with me and Judge uh, Dawkins. Um, when uh, we moved in Alexandria 13 years ago, Jaquan was Cameron's best friend in kindergarten. And after about a year or so, a series of events, um, my wife and I decided to take legal custody of Jaquan and Judge Dawkins signed the, the document for us to become his legal guardian. So there is a tie uh, with me and Judge Dawkins. Uh, so much of this has resonated with me, but when I started college 38 years ago, I remember about three weeks into college, and it was a, a huge college uh, with only about 2% uh, African Americans. Um, I was walking on campus one day, and a, a truck of guys uh, drove by and threw a cup of tobacco spit on me and said, nigger, go home. And I lived about 10 miles away, and I went home. And I told my mom, I quit. I'm not going back to that school. Um, you know, they don't want me there. And my mother told me, she said, you know what? You're going to run into some things. But don't let what they did affect you from doing the things that you need to do, the positive things in your life. You need to get your degree. Those kids are there. Forget them. They may get their degree or whatever. But you do what you need to do. And so I went back. I cried a lot. But every night when I had like a tough test or I wanted to quit, I actually thought about that night and what they did for me because they gave me strength mm -hmm. to keep moving on. Mm -hmm. You're going to have obstacles That's right. everywhere you go, but you need to say what's best for me and keep moving on. I just wanted to offer yes, those sir. two steps. Yeah, yes, and sir. I want to thank Judge Dawkins. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're quite welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. I, I guess we're, we're coming, coming to the end of this, but I, I think that it's important you understand the significance of, of this panel. You know, we, we, we've done this before, and we had Earl Cook, was on the, who was a former chief of police, was on the panel. And it's, it's important to understand that in many regards, we are the first. But I just certainly hope that looking out among you, we won't be the last. And that's, that's if I can leave you with anything, Aspire to be what you can be. And even if you can't, you know, we talked about education. Everybody's not going to go to college. But, you know, everybody's not going to get a degree in microbiology or history or, or physics. But you can be, do what you are skilled to do and do the best that you can. And be a good citizen. And no one's going to hold it against you. If you don't have a BS or a JD or MBA or whatever else is behind your name, but you can be what you want to be, whether you're white, brown, gray, purple, or otherwise, you can do that if that's something that's important to you. But again, I'll leave you with this last thing. Make the right, in terms of what I do for a living, the choices you make are the choices you're going to live with. So that necessarily, that necessarily mean I'm not necessarily talking about the concept of, of the law or otherwise, but the choices that you make in life are the choices that you're going to have to be comfortable with. That's going to be what your life's path is going to take. So African-American history, Af absolutely. This is African-American history, but this is not only African-American history. This is history about people. Look at this school. This school is something that's unique, not only to Alexander, but unique to the world. We've got the UN in this school. And each person, and don't, don't believe that because we talk about African American history, that this is the only history that's important. Your history is important, your history is important, your history is important. But your future is more important right now. Understand and learn from your history. Wait, two more minutes. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me, uh, it's, uh, yeah, somebody asked about obstacles earlier, and I couldn't think of one right away, and I went a different direction. But an obstacle that I had to overcome while I was, uh, upon graduating here at T.C. Williams, um, 
I mentioned I was a good student, outstanding student. I was president of the band and everything. And everybody knew me and very active, and I spent a lot of time in the principal's office, not in trouble, but the principal wanted to learn from me about what was happening around the school and everything else. And so, actually, I even had a, a, a key to the building because every morning I'd come in and uh, get here at 7, 7.15, and we open up the gym so we can go and play intramural basketball uh, before classes start. That's how much trust I had with the administration. But uh, I'm a Taurus, and Taurus are known to be stubborn, and I'm a, I was a stubborn kid all the way until I graduated from high school, and uh, if I didn't want to do anything, I didn't do it. And so even being a leader in the band, um, the director be ready, you know, to go, and he's on the, on the stage, and he'll stand, and he'll look over at me, and I'm first chair, you know, bass clarinet or something, and he said, Mr. Yule, are you playing? You're going to join us today? And I would just ignore him. Mr. Yule, and then he'd toss his baton towards me, and there was no smile or laugh from me, whatever. This went on for a while, and then finally, you know, we'd have a conversation about it, and I said, yeah, Mr. Dallinger, I just didn't feel well today, and so, you know, but... We got so that when we were graduating, upon graduating with our yearbooks, I approached him and I said, "Mr. D, will you?" We called him D, Mr. D. I said, "Will you sign my yearbook?" And he said, "Yes, I'd love to sign your yearbook." He said, "But you know, I'm going to say something to you that you may not like." And I said, "Oh, what?" He said, "You know what? You're one of the brightest kids the school has ever had." He said. You're smart, intelligent, everybody loves you. He said, but I have no doubt that someday you may become the first African-American president of this country. And I said, oh, Mr. D, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, this is unbelievable. And he said, but, he said, you're going to have to change your attitude. And I said, excuse me? He said, your attitude is going to prevent you from being successful. And you know what? That was like somebody stabbed a dagger in my heart, and from that day forward, I changed my attitude, and the rest is history. And the difference is, he was told he was the brightest. I was never told that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but obviously, I was able to succeed. So, you know, you don't necessarily have to be the brightest. You can be, you can be average, but do the best that you can. Okay. All right. Well, uh, first of all, um, I just want to, to thank you on behalf of T.C. Williams and the student body. Uh, let's everyone give him a round of applause. <laughs> you know, I believe it was Dr. King who said, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. And I think that that's, that's the subtext of, of a good bit of this message, that these people obviously are able to live well, but similar to Paul Robeson, uh, what good is it that mm -hmm. they can live well if their people suffer? Come on. So they came back to give valuable time to, to advance us collectively as a student body, and, and I'm so appreciative of them giving of their time. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to uh, bring Ms. Jones up, who's gonna talk a little bit about the logistics as we prepare to dismiss. But again, I wanna thank the teachers for, uh, again, bringing the students out. Um, obviously, you had curriculum and other things you could have done, but you thought that this was important to come out and allow your students to hear from our, our grades. So thank you so much, uh, teachers, who make all this possible as well. Ms. Jones.